Hey everybody, uh, we're going to take a look now at World War I on the home front. So uh, in class, we've kind of talked about what's going on over in Europe, and we talked about some of the U.S. soldiers and their impact in, in this whole thing as we get into Europe probably on Monday. Um, but we're going to talk about World War I on the home front. So I'm doing this one from home today, along with my little dog Bowie. He's here with me today, too, this morning to kind of take a look at this. And he's pushing buttons right now. Kind of funny. So we we'll talk, talk about the Selective Service Act. We mentioned this before about uh, how... Uh, the United States had a draft, and that was that Second Service Act. We got a, you know, a bigger army is the biggest thing. And the first time we ever had a uh, draft established before entering a war. I mean, the Civil War is a draft as well, but the draft didn't happen until during the war, until the United States started, started writing out of soldiers. So it kind of happened the draft before the war is pretty unique. Now, because of the draft, some people weren't so happy about this. Uh, you know, not everybody was, woohoo, let's go fight a war and that kind of stuff. Uh, there are a lot of different reasons why people didn't want, want the war. And the biggest were uh, both religious and political. Uh, Jane Adams, who we've talked about before in the whole house, I was one of those people. And um, she was like, no, this is dumb. Uh, she actually held a huge peace conference uh, in 1915 and uh, going on through 1917 when the United States eventually uh, declared war in Germany. Uh, trying to say, hey, let's, you know, talk this thing out, let's fix the problem versus go fight a war. And so, um, pretty unique that one too, she actually did that. And she actually got a, a group here called the Women's Peace Party, where women got together and said, hey, no fighting, let's have peace. Um, there were pacifists in the United States. A uh, pacifist, somebody who, uh, for some reason believes that wars are the wrong thing to do. They don't hurt anybody. And you could do what's called a conscience objector. Uh, you had to, uh, you oppose the war. If you got your draft number called, you had to oppose the war on some religious or moral reason that you could not serve. And you had to actually prove this uh, through a whole government process, um, you know, to make sure you didn't have to go. If you decide not to do the draft, you definitely risk going to prison. It was a huge deal uh, in that if you did refuse uh, to go fight in the war, you could have gone to prison. And this did happen to a lot of people actually during uh, World War One. Now, in order to make people want to join the war and volunteer for the war, uh, we have propaganda start in the United States as well. Propaganda is uh, a government message to try to convince people. And the United States try to convince people to, hey, the war is the right thing to do. And so uh, one of the nicknames for this war is the poster war. And so there's this agency called the Committee on Public Information that hired all these different people, uh, actors and reporters, directors, writers, historians, etc., to create this huge propaganda campaign where they're going to paint the Germans as these evil, evil people and that we need to go and fight them and help us and save Europe and that kind of thing. So here we have some idea of propaganda movies that got put out there. Uh, propaganda movies like The Kaiser, The Beast of Berlin, and The Claws of the Hun. The Hun was used to the Germans a lot. Um, the Hun was uh, uh, Roman in Roman history. The Hun where Huns were from with now modern-day Germany. They were the quote-unquote barbarians that the Romans fought. And so we kind of see uh, Germany painted as this evil savages that are going to take over the world. And so here are a couple of examples. Of this. Here we got Hulk the Hun. We have our, our valiant U.S. soldier smacking the German guy in the face here as he's, uh, as he's trying to hurt this innocent young lady here. We have the our regular divisions uh, kind of poster, the, the upstanding U.S. soldier. Um, and so he starts saying, we'll look at more of these posters uh, in class on Wednesday. We're going to look at a whole bunch of posters and have to analyze them to kind of look at what's going on with, uh, with the war effort. Um, we also have a war at home. So in schools, kids were actually encouraged to save tin cans and paper, all that kind of stuff. Uh, everything from paper to scrap metal to peach pits were actually saved uh, and recycled for the war effort. And by the way, the peach pits were for uh, charcoal to make gas masks for soldiers. I just, why I know that? I don't know, but whatever. Anyway, um, women got together and they met at homes and churches. They knit socks. Uh, they knit, knit, knit blankets for soldiers. The whole country was basically mobilized for this one cause. They also started making people, uh, some anti-German hysteria. We'll talk about this in class as well about, and especially here in Wisconsin, uh, there were some serious anti-German feelings happening around, uh, around the state and around the country. Um, you know, German workers were, uh, everyone who had a German last name was suspected of being an enemy, um, 
here in Wisconsin, uh, there was a, a situation where uh, they have people, uh, the you know, people go around, like the anti-germ people go around, and they would paint uh, people's mailboxes yellow, or paint yellow stripe, that yellow stripe meant that you might be a German sympathizer. Uh, they even changed the name of food, okay? Um, sauerkraut, which is a very German dish, became Liberty Cabbage. And, um, you know, uh, uh, the idea of a, of a, of a wiener, of a, of a, of, of like a, a, a sausage, okay, all became like hot dog and that kind of thing gets, gets out of this because of not trying to call it knockwurst or bratwurst or those kind of things. It was like Liberty Sausage and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you're a German American name, you could have gotten fired from your job, even though most German immigrants were like, Go USA, we like this, go fight the war. Uh, things were censored as well. Um, they said all things German came disloyalty, even sauerkraut. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, even sauerkraut. Um, you know, but there were things like uh, ger famous German composers like Ludwig von Beethoven. His music was disallowed. Libraries got rid of German authors. Um, papers that were written in German went away. I know um, I, I found the records of my, my home church in Shano, and they used to do a German church service. And during World War One, they actually stopped doing a German church service, uh, even though a lot of people there were German, spoke German, those kind of things. Uh, German newspapers got put away. Um, the, US, the Sauk City had a German newspaper, which did continue through World War which I'm not sure if it uh, was spent or not, but it was available after World War One. but I'm not sure if it was spent or not. I know there are a lot of German papers all around the state that were suspended. They actually got rid of uh, uh, German papers during this time as well. So there was a lot of censorship of all things German in the country at that time. Now, because a lot of guys are joining where we have an army that goes up to 2 million people, uh, women took over a lot of jobs that were traditionally done by men. Um, looking at a lot of these kind of jobs, which might be bank clerks, and ticket sellers, uh, chauffeurs, that kind of thing, even industrial jobs. Here we have women that are mining coal. We have women working in factories building uh, artillery shells for the war. Um, a lot of jobs taken over by women. And we actually see some big move for the women's rights movement. We see women get the right to vote. Just at the World War One, and kind of that that little push that that progressive movement needed uh, was the fact that women took over these jobs during World War One and helped to convince Congress to change that amendment uh, and get uh, rights for women. Uh, now, questions were fighting a war. So, how the heck do we pay for it? Wars cost a lot of money. All the equipment, all the paper soldiers, all that kind of stuff. How do we pay for this war? And so, the idea is to use war bonds. Uh, war bonds are a certificate, basically a loan you make to the government. So if you buy a hundred dollar war bond, you promise that you give the, that money to the government right now, and the government promises to pay that money back at a certain rate of interest. That's what they're going to do. And so the big push is for war. And you see a lot of uh, posters here that you buy war bonds. I'm not sure to pass. Uh, I have an actual uh, little war bond thing we'll pass around class to take a look at. Um, war bonds or liberty bonds provide a lot of the money that people need. You kind of see the posters here. I encourage people to buy war bond stamp, to buy a little stamp uh, as, a, as a way to, um, a little stamp as a way to kind of sh to purchase that bond. And then later on, after that bond matures at 8, 9, 10% interest, you get extra money back. So really, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like an investment for people to do. Um, and all the different movie stars and famous people, sports heroes, uh, baseball players, uh, football players, actors, actresses, uh, encourage people to go, authors, that kind of thing, encourage people to go and buy war bonds. Um, now, obviously, we don't have a very big army yet. We don't have a lot of equipment in our army yet either. And so we had to try and shift our total government here from buying goods to buy to buying war goods. So we uh, were supposed to create something called the War Industries Board. It was a government group that basically directed the country to create, to get enough materials for the war. And so they basically worked with all different government agencies, all the agency groups, all the factories, to make sure that we can, one, get enough military equipment, like guns and bullets and shells and all that kind of good stuff, and make sure it gets to the military in France. So basically they standardized all the work, all the wages, hours, working conditions, um, and basically didn't want people to go on strike. And you saw, uh, I wouldn't say maybe less strikes. There were still strikes that happened during World War One. Uh, maybe less strikes than we've seen, seen before. And especially see a little, little bit less labor unrest uh, during the duration of World War I uh, because the board said, hey, you're going to do this kind of stuff. No way fans are buts about it. Food-wise, soldiers need food. Okay, um, The best way you can make an army work is uh, make sure it's nice and fed. 
uh, Napoleon always said, an army marches on its stomach. And so you have to make sure that you can, uh, you can, uh, limit food product, uh, have enough food production happening in the United States. So Woodrow Wilson set up something called the Food Administration. And it was going to make sure that all food and fuel, uh, were going to the army that it needed. And so we, uh, he picked Herbert Hoover to run this job, this, this dude right here. Later on, he becomes president as well. And one of the first things Hoover did was raise crop prices. He jacked up the prices of wheat and meat and those kind of things for farmers and encouraged them to make more food. He also encouraged people to conserve food. And we see posters like this. Save a loaf a week to help win the war. Corn, the food of the nation. Save some every week. Basically he told people, eat less so that soldiers can have more. Um, you know, we have a part in victory. You know, basically plant your own garden. Don't make farmers spread all your food. Plant your own garden at home. They call those gardens victory gardens. Uh, so you basically plant your food at home. That way, the food being grown at the big farms is going towards uh, the soldiers. They also had things like Meatless Monday, Wheatless Wednesdays, where you wouldn't eat certain things on certain days of the week to uh, reserve it for uh, the soldiers. We also have fuel conservation, saving coal, saving oil, saving gas. Uh, cars are becoming a bigger thing at this time. There were gasless Sundays. There were heatless Mondays where you wore a sweater in your house versus uh, use your stove to make sure that all that stuff went to the soldiers. For African Americans, um, you know, he asked to make sure that he Wilson actually asked Americans to lay off things like lynchings and that kind of stuff, make it safe for everybody. Um, but for African Americans, that still happened. This stuff still went down. Obviously, the units during uh, World War One were segregated. Uh, There's still Jim Crow, law, Jim Crow laws. Those are great migration north. A lot of African Americans left the south, went up north for uh, to uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, those kind of cities to work in these industries. Um, and actually, newspapers, uh, African American newspapers at the time, urged people to leave. They called it the Great Migration, where you see African Americans move to these northern cities and work in the factory jobs that went that were there when uh, the Caucasian uh, guys left to go work at, at uh, work in the army and fight in the army. Last thing we have here is the Espionage and Sedition Act. Basically, while all this stuff is going on, and some people are going against the war, uh, the government makes it illegal to interfere with the draft or interfere with the war effort. And so it's these two acts called the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Uh, so the Espionage Act was in 1917, and basically it made it illegal uh, to stop any kind of recruitment effort for the military. So if you tore down a recruitment post, if you, you protest against the draft, those kind of things. That was illegal underneath the Espionage Act of 1917. Basically kind of felt that people were spying and trying to hurt the U.S. war effort. Even uh, ordered people to start censoring the mail. Anything that was leftist that was against the draft, against the war, got pulled out of the mail. Now, if you try to uh, mess with the U.S. war effort, try to stop the draft, try to argue, have a protest, that kind of thing, you were offered a, you, you were eligible to get fined for $10,000. Remember, guys. A U.S. soldier this time is making a dollar ten a day uh, or less uh, in the military. Ten thousand dollars could be your fine and up to twenty years in prison. Uh, and people did get arrested uh, over uh, on the on these charges. The other one was something called the Sedition Act. Basically, it was a crime to speak against the purchase of war bonds. You could not print anything, say anything uh, that said "Don't buy a war bond." And basically, it was, uh, or basically say anything bad about the United States at all. Uh, the words where you could not willfully urge, incite, or advocate any curtailment of production of things necessary or essential to, uh, to the uh, prosecution of the war, the intent uh, such a curtailment to cripple or hinder the United States uh, in the prosecution of the war. Now, obviously, this is kind of uh, going against things like freedom of speech, that kind of stuff. People are like, wow, why are we doing this in the United States? We're fighting for democracy. Well, we'll see what happens here. Uh, there was one guy, Eugene Debs, uh, we've heard him before, a member of the Socialist Party. You can see the quote on here that uh, he kind of argued that wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that the master class, the rich people, are always fighting wars, and that the, the, the poor people have nothing to, nothing to, nothing to argue. And when mm -hmm. Debs spoke out against this, he was actually jailed uh, for his acts. He was jailed for 10 years. He actually ran for president from prison uh, because he was... Uh, uh, put in jail under the Ethics of Act. There was a guy named Schenck, um, who and we'll look at his case as well, as well in class, uh, where Schenck uh, wrote a pamphlet against the draft. And he was also arrested and put in jail based on this. He said, bull crap, First Amendment. The Supreme Court actually sided with the United States and said that you could um, restrict freedom. All right, guys, we're going to talk about stuff in class. 
Uh, people just question. He